Mm so Tata Mungelia the Sendunaida. First we will recite the opening prayers. Can you all hear me? Please raise your hands if you can hear me. Okay. And today, the, somehow, because of the internet, I can't see all of you. Now, so if you can hear, please once again raise your hands.
Okay, I would like to offer my welcomes to all the monks and nuns from the different Kaju monasteries and nunneries, as well as all of my Dharma friends for, who are listening over the internet. So I'd like to offer you my welcome. Yesterday, we were speaking about the deities from the texts or the, the Vedic literature, the uh, Vedic period. So, yesterday, we spoke about the, uh, the gods in the heaven, uh, the first section, and the second were the gods in the air, the gods in between, and we've finished, gone through those. And now, the third is the gods of the earth. And so this is the point where we are now. When we speak about the gods in, the, when we speak about the gods on earth, Generally, in terms of the gods of the earth, today I will speak about three of them. The first is Agni, and in Tibetan, or in Tibetan, this is fire, the fire god. The second is Soma. Some is like the god of a, an alcohol or, of a, or also the god of the moon. So he is a particular god. And the third is Prithvi. This is probably the, the goddess of the earth. So I'd like to give uh, an introduction to these three gods of the earth. Among the gods of the earth, the first of these is uh, Agni, the fire god. And so the fire god when you talk the fire god, in ancient times, uh, this was a god who many people on the earth and uh, uh, the world uh, worshipped. This is because uh, fire was very important for the people uh, and the, on the earth, and for this reason, human beings would consider the fire to be like a form of a deity, to have the character of a god. In particular, in India, Agni, the fire god, became very important. In the Vedic literature, uh, Agni is recognized as a very ancient god. And so I think Agni was originally one deity, um, but he became a single god with a god with three different man of uh, manifestations and forms. And so that is there's a sort of sequence. And so later in the Vedas, uh, Veda, uh, uh, Agni took three different forms, and the three are the first of these is the sun and the sky. And the second was the god Indra in the sky, and the third was the Agni. So the three different forms, but in actuality, they're all uh, emanations of Agni, or they're all the same in essence, being Agni in essence. And when we speak about this, the sun in the sky and the Indra in the sky, 
and talk about Agni. So it's, it's as if uh, Agni has control over the earth, the air, and the, and the heavens. So in general, uh, the, the sun and Igna and Agni, and talk about in the terms of their, they're the same in significance or the same in importance. And if you had to choose one among the three and to say that one is the important one, this is the most important, who is that? And you had to choose one. It probably would be this Agni, the fire god. And for this reason, uh, the largest number of hymns are praises of Agni. And then the second would be to Indra. So Agni was uh, very important. And the origin of the worship of Agni, or how this arose, is because they were making off offerings to the fire god in fire office, and also because of the use of fire in daily life. And so it is from this that the tradition of worshiping uh, Agni developed. And so in particular, what the people of that time thought is that if you put the offerings to be given to gods into a fire, then the gods would be able to actually enjoy them and actually consume them, enjoy them. So this is what they believed. And so for this reason, that the fire is what connected the humans to the gods because you put the offerings into the fire and then the fire, then the God would be actually able to receive and consume them. And so for this reason, a fire was called the messenger of the gods. It was, the, it was what made the connection between gods and humans. So like for us today, as we have phones, right? And that we, if we want to make a connection with some, someone else or contact someone else, we use the fire. We, and so it's through the phone that we're actually able to speak with our parents and our uh, relatives. Similarly, in the old times, we couldn't actually see the gods. However, but what made the connection between the gods and the humans was to put the offerings to the gods in the fire, and then by that medium, the gods would be able to accept them. And in this way, the gods would also be able to hear and learn of the, of the people's desires. And so fire was considered the messenger of the gods. In particular, when doing a uh, fire puja, a, uh, a fire was absolutely essential. And basically, and also how could fire come, come about? And so if you rub two sticks of wood together, then a new fire would come. First, there's no fire. And then when you rub the two fire sticks together, then a fire is lit. And so for this reason, what the Indians thought is that, is that Agni was the, was the youngest of the, all the gods. And the reason is because at first he's not there, and then he arises newly. And so when, uh, and the fire is lit. And so he's new at that point. And so among the gods, he is considered the youngest of the gods. Likewise, Agni is extremely powerful uh, and extremely majestic. And the reason for this is that, one reason is that when we talk about the word gods in Sanskrit, this is called Deva. And the meaning of Deva means to illuminate. It means our light or to illuminate. And it's because of the, the light from uh, that the gods, uh, powers of the gods are able to become evident. or that we can, or that the, the gods are able to bring out their power. 
And so for humans, even the fire on earth has light. And because of that light, then like the sun in the sky, it was able to illuminate things. And so in that way, so they consider the God in the in heavens to be a God, right? And at that and so the, is that just as the sun has the ability to illuminate all things and sh show all things, uh, uh, fire also had the uh, power to be able to illuminate and show all things. And therefore, they thought that uh, fire also had a divine nature. And also, as I said before, fire is uh, is absolutely necessary for our lives as human beings. It's absolutely crucially important. And so this is a reason why people considered fire so important or so significant. So there are reasons for it, right? And so the idea of Agni being so important came from this. Now, Agni himself, when we think about Agni, we think that because of making offerings to Agni, what, is, what are the benefits that of offering or worshiping Agni or the powers of Agni? If we think of what are the powers of fire, one is that when you light a fire, is it can dispel darkness. It also has the power to burn impure things. If you put trash in the fire, if you put it in a fire, then it burns up, right? And so since fire has these two qualities, what people at the time thought is that the fire god Agni also had the particular powers of being able to dispel darkness and to subdue demons. Uh, so, uh, so what he's also, another name for him is Rakshahan. What this means is the demon slayer. So to know, like this demons or devils, right? So he was the one who was able to kill the, the demons. And so for that reason, Agni was also called the demon slayer. Also in the, in the Vedic period, everyone had in their own households, or there, everyone considered offering fire uh, pujas important in their own households. And when you're making or doing a fire puja, the main thing you do is you have to light a fire. Now, so even now, when we offer a fire, um, have a fire puja, we first uh, off, uh, invite the Agni, the fire god, as one of the worldly deities. And when we begin the fire puja, similarly in the in the ancient days, the main god uh, of, of this is the, the the deity Agni, and so for that reason. Uh, so another name of him is Grahaspati, which is like the means the Lord of the household. So it's like the actual head of the household is uh, is fire is uh, the fire god. Also, when we are doing uh, sacrifices, the it's through the medium of the Agni, the fire god, that all the offerings are given to the deities. So for that reason, another name that he's called by is is Havya Vahana. So Havya Vahana means basically the, the bearer of the sacrificial offerings. He's the one, the, the delivery person for the sacrifices. He's the person who takes them. So you need the delivery person to, uh, to take the, to carry it. So who is the delivery person for the offering? It was Agni. He's the one who took the offerings that we are that we humans had offered and he brought them up to the gods and that was agni who did this he was also called dutta this is calling him the messenger he's called the messenger of the gods and not only that he also agni also had other functions such as uh, ruling human beings or governing human beings like regulating the laws of human and of heaven and earth, which means like, and like uh, overseeing all of the uh, the rules of karma and cosmic and earth. And he also had the power of omniscience. Uh, 
And so Agni had many different qualities and and features. And so that is the subject of Agni. In any case, Agni, as you all know, is a, a God whom we encounter all the time when we give the uh, fire pujas. As you all know, when we do the fire pujas, we're always saying Agni, Agni, when we recite this. We meditate on Agni and make offerings to him, right? And so this is like the worldly uh, ritual, and then we enter, the, begin the transcendent, and we visualize, and then we and then we uh, make offerings to the deity, the Amandala, and all the various other deities, right? And so Agni is therefore also related to our secret mantra of Adriana rituals. Next is the second god of the earth. And the second uh, god of the earth is Soma. You could probably call the god of, of alcohol or the god of intoxicants. Now, one thing you all need to understand is the Brahmins really liked intoxicants. They really liked intoxicants. And because they liked intoxicants, what they thought is that since we like intoxicants, then the then the gods must also like intoxicants. And so better to if we offer it to them, then it's good. That's what they would think, right? And so they believed that the gods also liked to be intoxicated. Likewise, also the gods Soma and Agna and Indra. In the land, right? So Indra in Tibetan is named Jajan, right? So between these three, Soma, Agni, and Indra, there is a particular connection. And the reason for that is that you have the the is, is that the the intoxicant, the soma intoxicating drink, has a power to get you intoxicated. So if you drink this intoxicant, then you get drunk, right? So how does that come out when they thought about? It? And so you first have to to cook the. I think you have to first have to cook this. And when you when you cook the cook the intoxicant, then there you need fire. And so for that reason, they'd say that the uh, you have to have the, there must be the power of of agni must enter the intoxicant, and then because of that, then the intoxicant has the ability to to get you intoxicated. And then in terms of indra and. Um, it's because of Indra that the uh, that the intoxicant gains p potency, because he's able to, and because of that intoxicating power that he's able to, to the, it's because of the intoxicant that Indra is able to do many of his great deeds. And so Indra really liked to drink this uh, this uh, this alcohol or this drink, and he drank it at all. Then he'd get uh, get intoxicated, and then then become really especially courageous, and they get very strong. And it'd be able to defeat and slay and to destroy everything. And so, what they'd say is that, uh, so that the, 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 the intoxicant has the power of, of Agni, and by drinking it, Indra then becomes stronger because Indra then, through the power of, of uh, gains all his strength through the power of Agni. So, that is how they thought of it. So, in belief, this soma, this intoxicant called soma, was a specific drink of the gods and answers. So it must have had a specially uh, uh, power, uh, god in there. And so they decided there must be a god of it. Now, what this god is, not something like this, this soma intoxicant was something that all of the Aryan people had been drinking from their ancestral times. Their parents and their ancestors all drank it. And so this intoxicant was something that all our ancestors like. And there wasn't anyone who disliked it. And so it's because of this intoxicant that all the gods and humans uh, get, uh, because they get, they get to feel happy and why they get excited. And it's why they become really courageous. So we have to talk about the qualities of it. They're saying you have to drink, you have to drink, they're saying. You have to drink intoxicants if you don't. And you get and you get really good if you uh, the things um, if you drink this intoxicant because we're really good. And this wasn't just any other uh, just any old intoxicant. It was actually an uh, intoxicant that became by, divine by nature. 
And it was something that we presented. Like when we talk about when you talk about Amrita, right? In Amrita, this and actually in, in in essence is actually actually this is probably just a sort of intoxicant. When you give something to to the gods, it's basically it was alcohol. And when people would drink this, uh, when you drank the 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 alcohol that had been given by the gods, then you have uh, long and healthy lives, they said. And so for this reason, people thought of the the god of uh, the god of intoxicant soma, how he was connected to humans is that is that he and he was connected to people's hopes and prayers for the future because they thought if you drank the uh, drank this intoxicant you'd be able to have a long life and so they put their hopes in the god soma likewise later what happened is later during the later vedic period at the end of the vedic period this god soma then became also the uh, the moon god chandra So Soma is actually one of the names of the moon god Chandra. You can call him, you could call him Soma, you could call him Chandra, the moon god. But in essence, it's the same in essence. And what this shows us is that that during the time, the Vedic time, that the the Brahmins like an alcohol, and that uh, they considered it to have a particular potency. And so to speak about it in brief, the third god is. Is the goddess Prithvi. This is a goddess Homa Prithvi. I think this must be the same as the Tibetan goddess uh, Tenma. And the reason is that she's a goddess, has it? I've spoken about many of many, uh, some are like, um, some are said to be embodiments of the sky, some of them have been embodiments of the, of the sun. And here is thinking about this earth, this is also seen as the form of a god. And so Prithvi was considered an emanation of the earth. So in brief, because these gods in heaven had great powers and people felt great uh, faith in them. Likewise, the earth is the place where we all live. And so there's also, uh, from ancient times, there was a tradition of recognizing her as a goddess. But gradually her status, though she was very significant at first, her status gradually declined. And she wasn't considered so important. At the very beginning, what, at the beginning, what they thought was, is that Prithvi was the mother who gave birth to everything, what produced all things, because she's the ground. It's because of the ground that all things come. And so therefore the earth goddess, and she's like the mother of all things. Uh, what She's what gives birth to all things. Likewise, I also was talking about the heavens either the joining together and coming into union that all the gods were born from this union of the heavens and the earth. However, later, the tradition of worshiping and having being devoted to the uh, earth goddess uh, gradually decreased. And the main reason for this is that, is that the ground is what we step upon. So some beneath your feet. So if the ground is beneath your feet, since you're always stepping on it when you go, when you walk, uh, the tradition of having great devotion for her gradually, uh, gradually was lost. So for this reason, if you compare her to other deities, Uh, there are very few devotees of the earth goddess Prithvi. And if you look in the texts of the Vedas, there are fewer hymns to Prithvi. 
And so that is, is the end of the discussion of the gods of the of the earth. So the other day I spoke about the three different types of gods of the Vedas, the gods in heaven, the gods in air, and the gods on earth. We talked about these three three types, classes of gods. But there are also many gods who are not included among these. And so if you ask, are all the gods included in these three levels? No, they're not. But we discuss them because those are the, uh, because of their significance. And so now I'd like to introduce a few of the other deities. Now, the gods who are not included in the gods of the heavens, the air, and the earth, among them, there's the first one is Yama, who in Tibetan is called Shinje, the Lord of Death. The second is Saraswata, and she's an important goddess, so I'd like to introduce her. And the third is is Brahaspati, I'd like to give an introduction, in Brahaspati, and the fourth is Purusha. So the first is Yama. Now one thing we need to know is that when you think about it, he comes up in our Mahakala texts, and there are many rituals uh, connected with, uh, with the with Yama, right? So the Yama is the Lord of Death, right? And so I need to give you an important to the importance of Yama. And so what is, how is he described in the Vedic literature? When we talk about um, the Yama, we think of him as a wrathful deity. It's kind of a coarse, rough deity, right? That's how we think. We think of the wrathful, not so good. We don't really want to hear the name of Yama, the, the king of Dharma. But in ancient times, in the earliest uh, Vedic texts, Yama was not a, a rough deity or not a terrifying deity at all. It's just that gradually, later people made Yama dark, thinking that being dark is bad. And they gave some explanations of this, and they made him into a, into a frightening deity. But in the beginning, Yama was not at all that scary. In the Vedic texts, when they sang hymns to Yama, And the earliest uh, hymns to him say that say of Yama that it's so like you know the sun the sun sets every day right they they praised him like praising the sunset now sunset is it is it is personified as a god or that the setting sun was basically a, a representation or a symbol of death and the reason for this is that. When the sun sets, it feels a little sad. And when our, sun, our minds become sad and the sun sets, then naturally, think that just as the sun sets, one day their life will come to an end and they will die. And so when the sun sets, we think that we're going to die. And so that, for that reason, and because of that, then there became a connection between uh, the uh, between Yama and the future lives. Now, when we talk about future lives, when we talk about the terms of future lives, if they're future lives, then there needs to be a place where you go in your future life. There has to be a destination for your future life, and so and so there needs to be someone who rules over that place, a king of that area, right? So that's what people must have thought. And so who is that? 
That who is that king? Oh, that king must be Yama. The reason is that king is first like connected to the appearance of the sun uh, setting. And so not only did they identify the appearance of the setting sun as Yama, they also they didn't recognize him as, a, as an individual. But later, Yama Bika was th thought about as like an individual with like a human character. And so for that reason, gradually, Uh, Yama was identified as the king of the place where people would go after they had died. But the way we think of it, when we say that after we die, when 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 you die, then uh, that the, the king, the Yama, the king of death, is going to take you away. We think of that as bad. But at the time, the and India, ancient Indians didn't think that it was bad when when you died. And the reason they thought of this is because when good people died, that after they died, they would have, uh, get a new body that radiated light. They'd have this new body, and where would they go? They would go someplace where there was a lot of uh, shining light, a place where there is perfect happiness to a new a new land or a new place. And so who was there? The who was there was the Yama, the King Yama. They'd, they'd, so they'd go and they'd live in the country of, in the land of Yama. And if you could, they would stay in the presence of Yama, the King of Death, and uh, happily enjoying uh, inexhaustible riches and, and enjoyments. So it's like a place you'd go and you'd spend your time happily. So at that time, Yama was it was the one that everyone was hoping for. The 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 ruler, the king of the place where everyone wanted to go, a very loving and compassionate being someone who had great love. And that is how they thought of Yama. However, later what happened is that Yama changed. At first, you know, Yama was not a terrifying deity, but later, in India, there are the different, there are different non-Buddhist hymns or Brahmanical texts. There's a set of texts called the Puranas. And within these texts, what it says is that, is that Yama changed. He became the one who punished uh, punished wicked wrongdoers, people who had done misdeeds, who had committed wrongs. After they died, he was the one who would punish them, uh, who would uh, treat them badly, and so he became a very cruel um, and uh, terrifying deity. So when you think about that, this is the king, the king of death we thought about. So, so if you wonder if, if he is someone who's, is, is Yama someone who's going to die or not? Because when, when he, when everyone else dies, he's the one who has to rule them, right? Well, so has he never died, you said? Now, this is an interesting question. There is, uh, there is, uh, there are stories about this in the Vedas because the uh, because Yama was the first person to die. There was no one who died before him. Before them, they'd known it. So he was the first person in the world to die. And the reason for that, that is at this time, people didn't die at the beginning. And the reason they didn't die is because at that time, people had no suffering. They didn't do any misdeeds. And for that reason, they never died. But what happened is eventually they began to, per, committing misdeeds, uh, suffering happened, they began to catch various illnesses, and for this reason, then the fear of death, of the, the mortality, um, the mortal nature happened. And because people were going to die, 
Yama, the king of death, was first like a king among humans, like us, but when he saw the situation, he brought his uh, court along with him and went to the went to another place, the land, the land of the descents. But basically, so he went to a different place. He died. He died, and he arrived at the world of the next life. And so the first person to rise there was Yama, the king of death. And so for that reason, he was the first person to go to the next life, and he was the one who ruled that place, and so he became the, the king of the de of the deceased. And so what the reason why everyone was afraid of him at first was and so he had two dogs, and these two dogs, he'd always send them as messengers to go see what people were doing in the earth. And when he looked at those two dogs, they were really, really terrible because they had four eyes each, not just two, they had four eyes. They had huge snouts. And when you went to them, they had a really terrible stench. They really smelled bad. And because of this, people didn't like these two dogs at all, right? But, but at that time, the Yama, the king of death, was before the time that people started to suspect the king of death and be afraid of him. He was not the king of death, but at that point, but the two dogs, so they didn't think they didn't think bad of Yama, but they really uh, that is two dogs. They thought bad. They had a names for them. I don't need to uh, give the names of the dogs. Likewise, Yama actually had a, he had a young he had a sister. He had a sister, and actually he and his sister were twins. Twins, and so he had a, a younger sister, and her name was Yami. His name was Yama, and his sister was named Yami. Later in the secret mantra, then, then we have Yama, the, is the king of doesn't. It's called divided into two. One was, one is called, um, one is called um, Yamantaka, and the other is called Yama Damaraja, the king of the hell, hells, right? the one who had punished the, the wrongdoers. He's like the king of health. In the secret mantra, then Yama, then it comes in two different forms, the you know, Yamantaka and the, the Dharma king of the hells. So that's the topic of, uh, of the Yama. It's kind of complicated, but that's how it is. Now I've shown you three, the one riding on the bull, is the Indian depiction of uh, of Yama, the one in the middle, or on the on the right, is a excuse. The one in the middle is a wrathful depiction of uh, Yamantaka, the, the wrathful Yamantaka in the Japanese, and then the other side is a Chinese uh, is the Yama, the, the the king of death in the Chinese tradition. So, but the, the but the origin of them all is from India, Yama. So in Chinese they say Yamo in Chinese, but the source or the origin is Japanese. But they have different appearances. Uh, so that is uh, probably the same as the King of Death and the Yama, the King of Death in the Chinese tradition as well. Now, generally in the Vedas. And the early Vedic period, there were not very many goddesses. Mostly were male gods. Even though there weren't so many goddesses, there were a few. And among them, the uh, most important included the goddess Usha, whom I spoke about yesterday, the goddess of dawn. And then another goddess was, was Sarasvati. So Sarasvati, uh, you probably, most of you know of Sarasvati. Uh, 
later, there are also many uh, very well-known uh, goddesses. There is uh, the Durga and Kali and Lakshma. And so there are later in India, there were many well-known uh, Indian Indian goddesses, but they appeared grad uh, gradually over time. When the uh, Vedas first appeared, Uh, the goddesses had not appeared initially when the Vedas first appeared. So to speak about Sarasvati, I think I can speak about that later. So next I'd like to speak about this one. Brihaspati. Now, Brihaspati is like the god of aspirations or prayers. And the reason why there had to be a, a, a god of, of aspirations, a god of prayers, is that he had to be different than other ones. The, uh, originally, all the gods came from something in the natural environment. There was something, and then it was uh, that was called a god. But the god of, of prayer... The God of prayer, there's no there's no thing that you can say this is the basis for the uh of the for the mind of God. There's nothing. So it's like he was like a and so he's basically like a made up God or an imagined God, his own made up he's come uh, come out of thought. So in brief, the reason why there needed to be this God of prayer is what people thought is that prayers and aspirations had great power. If you made a prayer then you were able to gain influence over others. And that we are able to change the, the wishes of the gods through our prayers and aspirations. And so prayer had a particular power. So it must have had a divine nature or be a god, uh, as, as this is how they thought of it. And so for this reason, there became this god of prayer. Now, the way this god of prayer arose is that is that just as the just as they believe that there is a divine power in intoxicants and in fire, because intoxicants have the power to intoxicate you, and fire has the power to cook or to burn all all things. So they recognize them as being God. Similarly, aspirations also have that ability to gain influence or power over others, or to influence the thoughts and the wishes of the gods. And for so for that reason. The, the there originated this um, god of aspirations, Brahaspati. At the beginning, he wasn't such an important deity. Later, Brahaspati became an important one, particularly in the non-Buddhist terms, in the Upanishads, which we talk about. Uh, so Genji Triple uh, translated this Tibetan by the Tibetan word Nirgu. It can also be translated as, a, as the secret text, but in any case, it's an important non-Buddhist text. And within that, Brahaspati, the god of aspiration, is extreme is identified as an extremely important uh, deity, and he's given the name Brahaspati. Later, there are the texts called the Purana, Puranas, which is another type of um, Hindu literature. And so in the Puranas, he is asserted to be the highest. Uh, uh, he's one of the three great gods. He's basically he's identified as being Brahma. So at the beginning, Brahaspati. So later, he became the creator of the world. And he was recognized, uh, and he was thought of as the creator of the world. And the creator of the world was later recognized as being Brahma. So later they said that it was Brahma who was the creator of the world. So when the in the early Vedic period they didn't consider Brahma so important, but later first there was the Brahaspati. Later there were through when the uh, texts establishing the Hindu views ap appeared, there were the tech they started to take a lot of interest in who was the creator of the, of the earth, how did the world get developed, and they speak of, then they spoke about Brahaspati as the creator of the world, and so and then later Brahma was said to be the creator, and so later 
So after that, then Brahma became one of the three great teachers, so, uh, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva, and that's the reason why he was considered one of the uh, what's said to be the, those three main deities. And then the next one is Purusha. Purusha says. And here's another uh, imagined deity. He's not someone who is identified based on some feature of the natural world. Instead, he was uh, thought up through the mind, I think. So when we talk about Purusha, normally when we look at the, uh, the non-Buddhist texts, they talk about a self or a soul. So this is what we, the word means. Purusha means the self or a soul. So he's considered to be one of the most ancient, the earliest of the gods. He's said to have a thousand heads, a thousand eyes, and a thousand arms. Similar to our thousand-eyed, thousand-armed uh, Chenrezig. However, later Purusha became to be identified as like the nature of the world or like the soul or the self. Or you can talk about his consciousness or the self or the or the soul. And say that everything, all things come out of the expanse of the self and, and appear. And so for that reason, Purusha became very important. And it's particularly when the uh, philosophy text began to appear. After that, then Purusha, the world, And so they spoke about everything being a manifestation of the mind, as we say in Buddhist texts. And similarly, they said all things came out of the expanse of the self. And so for that reason, the Purusha became very important. Similarly, the praise or the hymns to Purusha, uh, the hymns to Purusha are very important. And the reason for this is that Are representative of the like the, the in, initial start of the caste system, as we often say that we talk about that uh, like the Brahmins being born from the forehead and so forth. It's related uh, uh, to to this the, the the tradition of a caste system is related very closely to uh, the god Purusha. And so for the time being, I've given the uh, introduction to the gods. And following this, I'll speak about, we've got 30 minutes, right? We have the 30 minute break and then we'll come uh, uh, reconvene and continue. I'll continue speaking then. I'm 
Om ba 